Hello everyone and welcome to Outside Interference. This is the first episode of UPW under the ESPN label. I guess UPW Fight Night because Night of Champions was aired on ESPN. And it is the first episode of UPW Fight Night under the Outside Interference label. So with that, uh, I just wanted to go over the size of UPW. Obviously we've been in business for two years I think it is now. And we've done pretty well for ourselves, uh, almost at a 20 popularity in pretty much every region in the world. I do expect it to be a little bit higher in America than it is everywhere else now that we're only shown in America. Although because we started on YouTube and that's how we were distributing our shows, I've decided for realism's sake, instead of just selling DVDs all the time, we're going to also air the episodes on YouTube through the, what's it called, uh, production, oh haven't changed it yet so it doesn't technically tell you that they're airing on YouTube but you kind of get the picture so with that I believe there's nothing really else to go over these are the champions in case you forgot Hanson, Jason Kincaid, Chaos, and Craven there's not really much else we need to get into so we can just go ahead and jump right into the show the show opens up with a promo by Barbie Hayden and Penelope Ford Hayden says, for the incompetent few that don't know who we are, my name is Barbie Hayden, and this is my good friend, Penelope Ford. We single-handedly built UPW's women's division last year, and now we're fully ready to bring it to the American people through this sad excuse of a wrestling show. Ford then says, there's a reason ESPN sent so much money on UPW, and I'll tell you right now, it isn't Steve Carino, it isn't Hanson, it isn't Kyrie Hojo, and it certainly isn't the ogre they call their woman's champion. It's us. Bombshells bring ratings, and we're the biggest draw this company has ever seen. So, obviously, some big words by Barbie Hayden and Penelope Ford. Uh, I can't remember if Penelope Ford has ever held the title, but I know she was in a pretty heated feud with Kyrie Hojo, and same with Barbie Hayden. So, you know, maybe their claims of running the women's division or building the women's division uh, aren't completely based in fact, but they should be respected nonetheless. Uh, moving on to the first match on ESPN, uh, or on Fight Night on ESPN, I suppose. In a decent match, Matt Morgan defeated Bill Carr in 827 by pinfall with a elevator. Morgan got a 44, Carr got a 34. This was just kind of a throwaway match, didn't really mean anything, but getting a 40 to start off the show, that's not bad for where we're at, so I'm pretty happy with that. Moving on. A videotape plays. It shows a large figure hidden by the shadows as the rise is coming to UPW appears on screen. So just a little bit of hype for an upcoming talent. Probably the biggest name we've signed to this point. Now that's not to say it's a huge star, but I think he can play into our roster quite well, and I already have a storyline set up for him to debut, so I am very excited for it, and he will be debuting later in this episode, actually, so stay tuned for that. It's going to be fun, I think. Hopefully it's not horrible, but he has good enough menace to get a 71 rating, so we can probably use him in some areas at least. And then in a decent match, David Starr defeated Angel Ortiz in 934 by submission. Ortiz only got a 31, but Starr was able to carry him a little bit with a 43. 39 rating. Okay match. I mean, it wasn't like a great match, but neither of these guys are really known to put on great matches. David Starr is obviously the most capable one of the two. Angel Ortiz is a tag specialist. But, you know, David Starr... Hasn't really gotten a good shake of things. He did get that feud with Hiromu Takahashi, but it wasn't really a feud. It was just kind of uh, uh, something to keep him busy, really, because I don't really have anything for him, or I didn't before this episode, but uh, he does play a big part in the next couple months of UPW. So you're going to want to stay tuned for that, obviously, and I hope you're excited for it because I do think David Starr will be the face of this company someday, or at least one of the faces of this company, if he isn't already. I'm definitely a big fan of David Starr in real life and in game, and I can't wait to show you guys what I have in store for him.
Moving on, Steve Carino comes down to the ring with a microphone and begins to address the audience. Sorry to interrupt, ladies and gentlemen, but there is something I need to address. Last week, at Night of Champions 2, we had an intrusion, an uninvited guest of sorts, who attacked me in my own building. And that is something I'm just not going to stand for anymore. If anyone in the back, in the crowd, or in the damn parking lot has a problem with me, they can come down to the ring right now and face me like a man. After a couple moments, Homicide emerges from the crowd, grabs a mic, and rolls into the ring. He says, Carino, I honestly thought we finished our business back in Ring of Honor, but when I saw you holding back and harassing my friend, my brother, Alex Cologne, that shit just didn't sit right with me. So I've decided to teach you some manners, Steve. Alex Cologne attacks Carino from behind, and Homicide joins in before the two are dragged away by security. So, a 48 rating. Pretty good rating, and this angle is obviously the start. I guess the start was at Night of Champions when Steve was attacked, but this is the continuation and build-up of the feud between Steve Carino and Homicide. I guess we didn't start the feud, that was in Ring of Honor. But it's certainly going to be a big part of UPW's future over the next couple months. Obviously, I mean, Steve Carino, the founder of UPW, is taking part in it. And he's always pretty high up on the card. Not exactly a Jeff Jarrett situation, though, because Steve has never held the UPW Heavyweight Championship. Uh, mainly because his ratings aren't nearly good enough. But I like to keep him in the mix. In a decent match, Barbie Hayden and Penelope Ford defeated Kyrie Hojo and Leva Bates in 1250 when Barbie Hayden defeated Leva Bates by pinfall, illegally using the ropes for leverage. In terms of in-ring work, Kyrie Hojo was head and shoulders above everybody else, something that we've come to expect from her. 41 rating. Uh, this was supposed to be the main event, but I thought better of it because I didn't really know how well Penelope Ford and Barbie Hayden would do, and I think that was probably a good decision because they did pretty awful. Uh, hopefully they can continue to be carried by the upper hopefully they can continue to be carried by the upper talent in the women's division because I do want them to be a big part of the division obviously by that opening promo it's just with ratings like that I'm not too confident that they will be so in terms of worker improvements Kyrie Hojo improved in performance which is kind of impressive slash unbelievable considering that she's the most talented wrestler on our roster. Uh, out of anybody, she gets the best ratings, and she is somehow still improving. So, I guess that's good for us. Moving on, in a decent match, Jason Kincaid defeated Donovan Dijak in 951 by pinfall. Kincaid makes defense number one of his UPW Ironman title. Obviously, this wasn't built up to or anything. It was just a quick match to end the show on a high note, hopefully. Uh, with the UPW Iron Man title, so there's a little bit of stake to drag people in a little bit. Uh, I don't know if it actually had that effect, because it wasn't a tremendous match, but I guess I wasn't really expecting it to. Uh, Jason Kincaid was off his game a little bit, but he still got a 44. Donovan got a 38. And these are two guys that I am looking to give bigger pushes in the future and just make a bigger staple of the UPW brand. Obviously, Jason Kincaid is already a pretty big staple of UPW, considering he is one of our few champions. But I feel like he could probably do more if I give him the opportunity. So that's what I'm going to be doing in uh, the next few months. Uh, I'm not tr I keep saying in the next few months. I'm not trying to give away what I'm doing exactly. But hopefully it's just a little bit of a teaser rather than me giving away what I'm doing. Because that wouldn't be good for the first episode back. Well, but, uh, but I suppose we'll see. As Jason Kincaid is collecting his title from the referee, the Chaos members come out to confront the Iron Man champion. Kincaid wears the belt on his shoulder as he comes face to face with the tag team champions. Cody says, Jason Kincaid, to most you are known as the technical wizard, the gift, the reigning and defending Iron Man champion, but to me... You are just known as my next victim. You have something that I want, Jason, and I'm going to do everything in my power to get it. JT Dunn and Joey Janela start to move towards Kincaid, looking to strike, but then Jason Lee's music hits. 
Lee says, whoa, 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 Cody. Do you think that just because you and your pansy-ass friends can bully around the tag division that you can steal my opportunity at the title I made relevant? That's not how this works, Cody. You aren't going to get any free passes just because your dad was friends with Hulk Hogan. Obviously, Cody does not take lightly to that. He is pretty offended, and they all brawl in the middle of the ring, which has to be broken up by security as the show comes to a close. Great first episode on ESPN, at least I hope. We'll see what the rating is. And it's a 47, so a pretty good episode. Started a lot of storylines, continued... No, I guess like we continued one storyline with the Steve Carino and Homicide stuff. And hopefully I didn't forget too many storylines, because that would be bad. Uh, I tried to go back and look at my old videos to see if I was forgetting something, and I don't think I did. I think I pretty much finished everything at Night of Champions. If I did miss a storyline or something, make sure to tell me in the comments below. But uh, before that, let's get right into the next fight night. So we start off this show with a bout that had decent reaction from the crowd, but subpar wrestling, where Penelope Ford defeated Kimberly in 656 by submission after distraction from Barbie Hayden. Penelope Ford was really off her game, the color commentary gave the match a boost, Kimberly had an in-ring performance of 35, Penelope Ford of 25, and it got a 32 rating. So, pretty good match to start off the show, at least from the women's division without Kyrie Sane or Leva Bates, because that's normally not the best, but let's go ahead and move on with the rest of the show. In an extremely short match, Vanessa Craven defeated Britt Baker in 443 by pinfall with a sit-out powerbomb. This got a rating of 32, Britt Baker got a 31, and Craven got a 38, so Craven's actually not doing bad in the ratings. Britt Baker probably has some room to work, I suppose, and I don't think there are any worker improvements, so we can go ahead and move on. As Britt Baker walks to the back, she is passed by the bombshells who are striding up to ringside with microphones in hand. Barbie says, Craven, so good to finally meet you. Penelope and I are such big fans of your work. Ford then follows up with, We really are. The fact that you were able to win that belt without facing either one of us is very impressive. But I think everyone watching knows that that's the only reason you're holding our title. Then, Leva Bates' music hits as she emerges from the back with a microphone. Bates says, Penelope, correct me if I'm wrong, but you really haven't done anything of note since you lost your title, haven't you? No. No, I didn't think so. And Barbie, you've had less matches in the last year than most of us have in a week, so I don't think you're really in the position to talk. If you want a title shot, you need to do a little more than piss off the roster. Speaking of, I suggest you two look behind you. Craven clotheslines the two from behind as Leva walks to the back. This got a 48, so pretty good rating. Uh... Best rating, or best rating of the night, obviously. No worker improvements, but can't really expect one with this kind of angle. There's not really much to talk about here. Obviously, I, I just wanted to move the title picture away from Kyrie Hojo, because even though she is going to be a huge part of the women's division regardless, because obviously she is the best in the women's division, and likely will be for a long time, it's kind of stale to keep putting her in the title picture over and over and over again, especially because it's kind of hard to believe that she is losing repeatedly if she is as good, and it just, eventually it's just not going to work for her character, so I've decided to move her away from the title scene for the time being. Almost definitely going to be back there eventually, but uh, we'll see. Moving on to the next segment. In a decent match, The Colony defeated Chaos in 727 when Fire Ant defeated Cody Hall by pinfall with a beach break after a distraction from Jason Lee. Fire Ant was unfortunately really off his game, and Silver Ant got a 35, Fire Ant 30, uh, that is really off Fire Ant's game, he normally gets like 40s. Cody Hall got a 37 and JT Dunn got a 43. So all together, a pretty good match, best of the night so far, although I do expect it to be passed up soon. Jason Lee interfering against Cody Hall. Obviously, they do not like each other very much. And with that, Jason Lee is kind of hinting at a face turn as it's... Well, for one thing, I have too many heels. And for another thing, I think it's kind of time to change his character because I feel like if I didn't, I'd ha just have too many, like... Basically, just Chaos members that aren't in Chaos. And... I don't really want to do that, so I feel like turning him into a badass babyface is going to do a lot more for him and make it a lot easier to book him. So that's what we're going to be doing in this next segment.
Jason Lee grabs the mic and hops the guardrail as he is leaving. He taunts Cody from the safety of the crowd. Lee says, your dad's toothpick can only cover an inch of your ass, Cody. You have to cover the rest. So just a uh, nice little line there by Jason and gets the fans behind him because obviously, I mean, I think it was a pretty clever line, even if it's a very slim inch being a toothpick. But, you know, don't read too far into it. Uh, just know that Jason Lee is a badass babyface now. At least he is now. Oh, below average on the gimmick. Uh, it's fine. Gimmicks don't matter in UPW. And the turn went pretty well, which is good because it said it probably wouldn't. But uh, moving on to the next segment, really going into high gear here, Steve Carino and the Rise, Ryan O'Reilly, are sitting in Carino's backstage office. So the Rise is Ryan O'Reilly, also known as Connor in the WWE, and that was just a little bit of exposition. Carino, first off, Ryan, I just want to say what an honor it is for you to handpick UPW as your new home after your departure from WWE. So, as a welcoming gift of sorts, I've decided that if you can beat Joey Janela tonight in your debut match, you'll get a shot at the heavyweight title at Kings of Old School. O'Reilly says, well, if all I gotta do is beat Janela, then you better get a head start promoting my title shot. And this got a 46, a little bit lower than I thought it would considering that Ryan was rated on Menace and that's like a 90, but I think it's a decent debut. Obviously not just to debut him in a segment, but to debut him against Joey Janela for a uh, number one contender spot, considering that Hansen doesn't really have anything going for him, although that might change later in the night, we'll see. And with that, we'll go ahead and move on. In about that a good heat and decent wrestling, Ryan O'Reilly defeated Joey Janela in 659 by pinfall with a rooftop drop. Janela got a 36 and O'Reilly got a 42. So O'Reilly not giving us the best ratings, as this match only got a 37. But he's definitely in the upper mid-card slash lower main event status. I guess he is just about at the same in-ring ability at, as Hansen. So you can't really complain there because honestly I didn't spend that much money on him. And with this new ESPN deal, Jesus guys, we get like $20,000 from every airing. It's pretty insane. So I'm going to be upping the production value so hopefully we can grow a little bit quicker. Uh, I forgot to do that between episodes, but... It will happen before the next episode because I'm going to be booking a lot today because I finally have a day off of work, but that's besides the point. Let's go ahead and move on to the next segment. A decent match. Hansen defeated Trent in 15-13 by pinfall. Hansen makes defense number two of his UPW heavyweight title. So this was just kind of like an open challenge situation. Maybe Hansen called out anyone on the UPW roster, like on Twitter or something, and Trent was like, hey, I'm here, I'll fight you. And Trent ended up outperforming Hansen with a 47 to Tr Hansen's 45. No worker improvements, but a 41 rating in the main event, I believe. I, yeah, it's the main event. Isn't bad. It's not great, considering that our last event did quite well. Actually, I looked back, and it's one of the best events of the last couple weeks. So I expect this one to be a little bit more middle of the road. But hopefully ESPN doesn't get too mad at us. Because, you know, you got to draw people in first and then get back to the uh, thick of things. And we'll go ahead and move on to the next segment. A 56, that ought to help the rating. After an extremely close match, a beaten and battered Trent reaches out to shake the champion's hand. Hansen accepts his hand and then follows with a clothesline. He picks up the former tag champ, throws him out of the ring, and then, after taunting the crowd, power bombs Trent through the announce desk. After a few moments, Rocky Romero runs out to try and help his partner, but instead gets hit with a Sin City plunge. Hansen raises the title above his head as medical personnel tend to Rapongi Vice. So Hansen has kind of inadvertently shaken the UPW tag scene. Someone's going to have to come up as the new number one contenders to Chaos's titles, because obviously after being destroyed on ringside, here in UPW we like to keep medical continuity going strong, so Rapongi Vice will be missing quite a few weeks. Probably no more than a month, and and if you want the true story, it's uh, Rocky Romero is signed to tour with DDT, so it was kind of important that I didn't put him into any major storylines, and I just think that this is the easiest way to do it, as I can still have Trent appear on the show as maybe like a commentary position, because I feel like he'd be quite good at that, but until then, he is on the stretcher. So, moving on to the end of the show, we'll see how we did. 43. 
that's not actually that bad. Only four points less than the last one. And I feel like our run-of-the-mill shows are like 42, 41, kind of. So a 43, that's not half bad. Good way to end the episode, I suppose. Hopefully you guys like the revamp. I guess it's not really revamp, just the return of UPW. Um, I think I've said that quite a few times. Not just in this episode, but back when I returned after a month. But yeah, this is the new UPW on ESPN. Fight Night is going to be, obviously, huge. Hopefully, uh, we are gaining, you, we're gaining viewers every week. And I just hope that someday we'll be able to compete with the big leagues like WWE and New Japan. But until then, I hope you guys stick around for the ride. And this wraps up another episode of Local to Global. Thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one.